All right, so we're just going to kind of pick up exactly where we left off. We had gone through the major causes of the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany. And as I explained in the beginning of the first part of this lecture, we need to know the causes, the process, and then the impact. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into the process now, starting with Italy. So let's look at our map. And this is this jigsaw puzzle that I want to explain a little bit more detail to you now. When you talk about the unification of Italy, there are multiple parts here you can see on the map here. The most important is what we call the Kingdom of Sardinia, or sometimes we call it the Kingdom of Piedmont. I've seen it in some books called the Kingdom of Piedmont. Sometimes I see it called the Kingdom of Sardinia. But it's everything you see in the kind of bluish purple areas there, right? So that's one region that's important. So all of these are like the, the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that need to come together. Uh, so that's one. They were the strongest Italian-speaking group at the time. Then you have all these areas in yellow, uh, Tuscany and Naples down here, uh, Sicily down here at the very bottom. You can't really see it well, of course. Uh, that all of those areas are also Italian-speaking, but they're independent states. They're not united. The maybe most important parts are these two areas around Venetia and Lombardy, right? And in those areas of Venetia and Lombardy, both of those areas are Italian-speaking people. It's very small here. You may not be able to see this well, but you definitely want to get it down. Those areas are controlled by Austria. So Austria right here, just north of Italy, was very powerful. They had controlled that area. And then you also have the Papal States here in the center part of Italy, and they're, of course, controlled by the Pope. So that's the jigsaw puzzle that needs to come together, right? And there's a number of people involved in bringing this jigsaw puzzle together, but there are really four important people that I want you to know. Three of them I'm going to talk about. One's going to be in your textbook you're going to read about. Uh, but combined, these four men are very significant. If you go to Italy today, a lot of monuments to them. If you go to Italy today, a lot of streets are named after them. Uh, so let me go to our kind of our key words. Hopefully all that's kind of clear. And again, you have maps like this in your textbook. So one of the things is, yeah, you've got these YouTube videos, but use your book, right? You're supposed to use your book all semester too to help you with these lectures and, and follow and everything. And there's more information in there that I may not even talk about. All right. Uh, so let's go to our keywords, all right, or key names in this case. So these are the big four, right? These are the four names you're going to need to know. You're going to need to know each of them. Uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, Victor Emmanuel II, Camilla de Cavour, and Garibaldi. Um, uh, you know, one of the things is we cover the Italians, then we're going to cover the Germans. And I can understand these are a lot of new names, and maybe you mix up a couple of the Italian names. I never understood how people can mix up the German names with the Italian names. I mean, if I talk about a guy named Heinrich, he's obviously German, right? If I talk about a guy named Giuseppe, he's obviously from Italy. So let's start with the first one, Giuseppe Mazzini. Who is Giuseppe Mazzini? Well, Giuseppe Mazzini was not some big, powerful leader of a nation. Giuseppe Mazzini was part of a group called the Research, well, he was part of a group called Young Italy and a movement called the Risorgimento. What is this? Well, he's this nationalistic figure. So you have nationalism, and Giuseppe Mazzini is a nationalist. He believes in a united Italy. And what he would do is he would simply go around these Italian states giving speeches. Let me just read to you a short excerpt so you understand what I'm saying. He says the following. Young Italy is a brotherhood of Italians who believe in the law of progress and duty and are convinced that Italy is destined to become one nation. Convinced also that she possesses sufficient strength within herself to become one, and that the ill success of her former efforts is not to be attributed to the weakness, but to the misdirection of the revolutionary elements within her. That the secret of force lies in consistency and unity of effort. And he goes around giving speeches about how you need a united Italy and it's good for everybody, and that's all fine and dandy, but what does Giuseppe Mazzini not have? Any sort of military, any sort of political authority. Where is that going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the king of Piedmont, or Sardinia, a man named Victor Emmanuel II, and those are the years when he ruled. I'm going to show you a picture of him in a second here, so go ahead and get the, uh, the names down, and then we'll kind of uh, talk about the rest of it. So this is, so this is Victor Emmanuel II. Make sure you get Camille de Cavour and Garibaldi. And there's Victor Emmanuel II with that 
crazy looking mustache, right? So I was kind of like showing this image of him. And he loves this idea. He loves the idea of a unified Italy. Why? Well, he likes the idea of a unified Italy, but it also means he gets to be ruler of more than Sardinia or Piedmont. He gets to rule over the entire Italian kingdom if he's the one who spearheads it. So here's again our map, and you know, here he is in the kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia, and he's like, I love this idea. So he goes to Camillo de Cavour, that was the other name you saw there. Cavour is, I guess, the best way to describe him as kind of the prime minister, uh, his right hand man. Um, and he understands, Cavour does, that he has now been given the responsibility to try unify Italy. Now, Italy has not been unified in centuries. This is not an easy thing to do, but he's going to try to bring it together. And so to do that, he needs to do a couple things. First of all, he needs to solidify the kingdom of Piedmont. He needs to build up a military. Why does he need to build up a military? Because he knows he's got these two areas of Lombardy and Venetia that are controlled by Austria. And he's not going to just, you know, Austria's not just going to give up those just because they're nice, right? So you need to have some strength behind you. So he starts by building up the military. This is all in the 1850s, building up. And then he also understands, Cavour does, and maybe Victor Emmanuel II does as well, uh, that they need help. And so who do they turn to for help in the 1850s? Well, they go to France. And who's there in France? Well, remember Napoleon III. And so they go to Napoleon and say, hey, Napoleon, we'd like, you know, Piedmont, Sardinia to be bigger. We need your help probably to get these areas of Lombardy and Venetia. Will you help us? And Napoleon says, okay, I'll help you, but I want something. And these are other two terms you want to know. I didn't put them on the key terms, but you want to know them. I'll just put them down here. Nice and Savoy, right? So Savoy, S-A-V-O-Y, in case you can't see it and Nice, N-I-C-E, it's a Nice, not Nice, and these two areas are part of the kingdom of Piedmont, but they border France, and there are a lot of French people there. So what Napoleon III says is, I'll help you with Lombardy and Venetia if you give me Nice and Savoy, and that was the agreement that was made. And so the agreement was made, Nice and Savoy around 1860 go to France, and then Napoleon helps Piedmont not get everything, but just get Lombardy. So he get, helps him get Lombardy. So that's how the, the unification, this is the process, right? This is how it begins. And so now they give up a little bit, they get Lombardy, it's got a lot of Italians there in the kingdom of Piedmont, the momentum starts to get going. After they get Lombardy, that was in 1860 roughly, then for the next several years, or next year really, next year or two, uh, a lot of these other areas that were independent, Tuscany, Parma, Modena, you don't need to know all these names, right? Nice and Savoy you need to know, Lombardy, Venetia you need to know, but all of these areas there that were independent, they just like, you know, we're in, right? You guys are obviously serious, Victor Emmanuel II. You really want this to happen. We're Italians, you're Italians, we're in. And then once they all join forces, then they have enough power combined to take on Austria again around 1866 and take over Venetia, right? So there's a lot of moving parts to this. Let me just go through this again because I think I may have gone through it a little quickly, so I want to make sure you're clear. So again, first step is making, building up your military. Second step is forming an alliance with Napoleon III. You give up Nice and Savoy, he helps you get Lombardy. Third step is a lot of these independent states you see on green on this map, they agree to join the kingdom of Piedmont. Fourth step, by 1866, they're all kind of together. They have enough strength, they take on uh, Austria and they convince Austria to just give up on Venetia. And so by the time we get to about 1866, everything you see on this map here is pretty much under the kingdom of Piedmont. Uh, there is, of course, the issue of Sicily. For Sicily, that's where Garibaldi plays a big role. Make sure you read your textbook on him. And you need to explain this, right? If, if you have an essay question on this is for your one of your possible essay questions on the final, and I'll give you the review sheet for that pretty soon, uh, obviously, you need to talk about all of these men, even the ones I don't lecture on that are, might be in your textbook. So keep that in mind. So they get that region as well uh, through the help of Garibaldi, and then all that's left is the Papal States. And essentially, by 1870, the Papal States, the Pope says, you know what, okay, we're in two, with the exception of the Vatican. 
And in fact, if you go to Italy today and you go to Rome today, if you go to the Vatican, technically, when you walk into the Vatican, you're walking into an independent country. It's an actually an independent nation. Uh, but that's how the jigsaw puzzle comes together, and that's how Italy becomes united. And Victor Emmanuel II is now the kingdom of king of all of Italy. Um, pretty big, pretty impressive. And really, remember before the midterm, I talked about this optimism. If you know, would the, you know, think about this? Is this an optimistic time if you're living in Italy? Of course it is. They just unify. This hasn't happened in centuries, and now they're united. So in that sense, it's another good example of this optimism in the mid 1800s by a lot of these Western civilization nations. Victor Emmanuel II is very popular. If you go to Italy, he's actually buried in the Pantheon, uh, you know, one of the, the most famous ancient Roman monuments, and he's buried right in there today. So he's very popular. All right, so I hope that's clear. And again, you have a chart. You can kind of print that out. You can look at that. You have your textbook. You can always listen to all that again. If I went a little bit too fast, that's right. I tried to go over it a couple times there for you. Uh, but that's essentially how Italy unifies. Make sure you read your textbook to give you a little bit more information on that. All right, so I hope all that's clear. Next, Germany. All right, with Germany, there are going to be three key people you need to know. Okay, so here they are, a man named Heinrich von Gagnon. Uh, Kaiser William I and a man named Otto von Bismarck. Some people have heard of Bismarck before, the other two probably not so much. So let's start with Heinrich von Gagen. Who is he? Well, he's kind of like the equivalent of Giuseppe Mazzini is in Italy. He is not a king, he's not a ruler, but he is a nationalistic leader. And just like Mazzini would go around Italy, Heinrich von Gagen goes around all these areas in Germany and he gives his speeches. He says, we want more sense of community among the several states of Germany, greater unity in their policies and in their principles of government, no separate policy for each state, but the nearest possible relations with one another. Above all, we want Germany to be considered one land and the German people, one people. All right, nationalism, right? Pure nationalism. Let's be together because we have a common language, culture, traditions, customs. Again, nothing wrong with that. Um, and so this is what he does. But again, he doesn't have the power. Where is the power going to come from? This man named Kaiser William I. Who is Kaiser William I? And be careful, you are going to get a Kaiser William II. You don't want to mix them up. And so this is where Roman numerals matter. Uh, and then Otto von Bismarck I'll talk about too here in a second. So Kaiser William I, he is the leader of Prussia. He's the Kaiser of Prussia. So here's our map. So this is the jigsaw puzzle. So here you can see on this map, Prussia in purple. Everything in purple on this map is Prussia. And that's the area that Kaiser William I controlled. What about all these other colors that we're concerned about? The areas you see in blue here, all of that was controlled by Austria. Austria had influence in that area. The areas you see in orange and in pink, those regions are independent German states. There's like the Northern German states, Southern German Confederation. Uh, so those are independent areas, right? So you have that. Uh, obviously, you have some areas here in the green that kind of border Austria, and these are going to kind of uh, kind of be border areas that aren't going to be initially part of the, the situation. So we're not too worried about that region. But we are worried about here in yellow. And what is that in yellow? Well, that is the most important piece of real estate in our entire story. Um, and it is this land of Alsace-Lorraine, right? So I put it up there for you before. Uh, Alsace-Lorraine, that is going to be key in this story of the unification of Germany. Who controlled that area? France, okay? So that was controlled by France. So Austria controls a bit. Prussia is obviously the strong independent nation, a lot of other smaller independent powers, and then Alsace-Lorraine here, controlled by France. Okay, so what's the deal? How does this all come together? Well, we had talked about Heinrich von Gagen. Kaiser William I loves the idea of a unified Germany because that means he gets to rule over all of Germany. So he really designates a lot of this to Otto von Bismarck. So he goes to Otto von Bismarck. Let me show you a picture of Bismarck. There he is. That's Bismarck smiling. Um, and this is Otto von Bismarck. And he is given now the job 
to unify these areas. So how is he going to do this? Well, he's going to fight a couple wars. So here's kind of the wars, and I put Alsace-Lorraine here again. Austro-Prussian War, Franco-Prussian War, and then the territory of Alsace-Lorraine. So the Austro-Prussian War, I'm going to just get these terms down again, and then I'll show you when and where they are on the map. So let me go to the map here, so first get them down. All right, so the Austro-Prussian War is Austro, Austria, against Prussia for control of the areas you see in blue, where it says like a hand over there. Um, and that's this is all again 1860s is when all of this is happening. You don't need exact dates, but 1860s you have this fight there. Prussians win and they take over that region. So that's the first kind of major step. After the Austro-Prussian War, then all these regions you see in the orange and the pink, they jump into this unifying Prussia idea, right, or Germany. So areas like Weimar and then all these areas down here near Munich, of course, that we associate with Germany, all of them join in as well. So the unification of Prussia, of Germany, is a little bit easier because Prussia was already strong. It wasn't like the small little kingdom of Piedmont or Sardinia. Prussia was strong. Remember, we had talked about Prussia earlier. Um, and so, you know, they take over Hanover, they take through the Austro-Prussian War, they take over these other areas because they're, they're willing to join. And then their last piece of real estate that they really want is Alsace-Lorraine. And so there you have what is called the Franco-Prussian War, and it is France against Prussia. This is around 1870. Um, and so they fight this war, and the Prussians win, and they take over Alsace-Lorraine. Why is this so important? Well, some of you may already know a little bit more history than we haven't gotten to yet, but think World War I, guys, right? This is going to be really significant when we talk about uh, World War I. This is going to be one of the reasons World War I happens. So that's it. By 1870, the unification is completed. And so now it's no longer Prussia. By 1870, 1871, we now call it Germany, right? And so this is the unification. So make sure you know all the parts there and how the process happened. Again, the key thing is knowing those names, knowing those key people, how they were involved. So you have the four Italians, you have the three Germans, and you have the process you need to understand. So I hope all that's clear. Once they have the unification in Germany, they have a big celebration. Here's a whole bunch of Germans smiling um, in the ceremony of unification. Uh, again, I think it's 1871. They start calling Germany. This is also, by the way, you know, sometimes people hear of Hitler and they hear the Third Reich. Uh, guys, this is the Second Reich. This is where did Hitler come up with that term? Well, this is the second. And the first one, I think, was based on uh, when uh, the, the, the Frankish kingdom under Charles the Great and, and that was early Western Civ History 110. If any of you get a chance to take that class, if you haven't, uh, it's all early Western Civ stuff, a lot of fun things in there. Uh, so that's where I talk about that. All right, so that's the unification. So now we understand the causes, we understand the process, we understand how Italy unified, how Germany unified. Now we need to get to the last point, the impact. So here is our general map again. And why do we care? So let's start with the unification of Italy. Why does it matter that you have the unified Italy? Obviously, I already gave one reason. You know, it brings about more optimism, you know, so that's something for people living in Italy. But the other reason in a unified Italy is important is it creates another superpower in Europe. Uh, maybe not as powerful as England or France, but look at where they're located. They're jutting out in the Mediterranean Sea, so geographically they're important. They're going to be important for trade and economics. Uh, one of the other really important impacts of, of, of unifying Italy is not for World War I, but for World War II. Why? Well, because, of course, if you know anything about World War II, Mussolini, uh, Mussolini is going to have tremendous influence and power here. And one of the big fronts of World War II, it kind of gets cut off on this map, but North Africa. And by having Italy strong and unified, it puts a lot of pressure on the Allies when they have to deal with any combat inside of um, North Africa. So they're going to play a big role there. Uh, they're going to play a role in World War I as well. So the unification of Italy, it's important. Obviously, it's another power. Italy is still Italy in, in Europe today. Uh, but as important as the unification of Italy is, the biggest impact of our story today is the unification of Germany. 
why? Well, so here's where Germany would be roughly, right? I'm just kind of, maybe it's a little, no, it's actually a lot bigger there than I made it than it should be. Uh, so let me kind of make it more accurate here. So, you know, right around here, all of this region, right? Roughly, 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 roughly is going to be Germany, right? Not quite, again, still too, there you go. Um, and what's the deal with this region of why we had care that in the center part of Europe, you have a kind of a unified Germany? All right, let's take, let's, let's do this. So first of all, we're going to do something you're taught never to do. We're going to stereotype. We're going to generalize. Uh, and sometimes you have to generalize a little bit to understand the significance of history. When you think of the German people, what do you usually think of? And a lot of people think, well, okay, Germans, what do we think of? And a lot of times people think militarily aggressive. Well, yeah. Now, are there pacifistic Germans? Of course, you know, uh, yeah, again, we're talking at that time in history, of course. Um, of course, there are pacifistic Germans. You know, one of the things about generalization is for every generalization, by definition, there are exceptions. And so, but there's this, this reputation that they've had. There's the other thing about Germans that have a reputation of being very efficient, very hardworking. You will do it, you will do it on time, and you will like it, right? Uh, what was, there's a joke there in World Wars uh, One, Two, I believe that the World War Two, I think it was that the only way the trains would run on time in, in England if the Germans invaded, uh, because it's like everything is very good. German engineering, right? When you think of German engineering. It, it, it connotates a very positive thing, right? You know, you think of German freeway, like the Autobahn. You drive, you know, 150 miles per hour, smooth, right? You go on the, you know, four or five freeway here or the five freeway, my God, like boom, 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 boom. You're lucky if your tires don't fall off. Um, and so the, the, the whole thing with Germans is those are the reputations that they have. Now, again, there are exceptions. There's, you know, we're generalizing. That's, I get that. Why do we need to generalize a bit? Because when you think about a unified Germany. What have you now created? A massively strong power of people sitting in the central part of Europe with a lot of resources and the mentality of being very efficient and hardworking and a history of being militarily aggressive. Now, all it takes, therefore, is a strong military leader that says, I want war, and you got a problem. Because one of the key things about where Germany is located, Germany has an ability to attack almost any other country in Europe, because they have access to the seas as well, without having to cross another country's borders. I hope you understand what I mean by that. If, if you're living in France, you can't just hop over to, to Poland or, or Austria, right? You got to go through a bunch of areas. Germany doesn't have to do that. They're centrally located. So they're centrally located. They have a lot of resources. Uh, they, they have this very strong optimism now because, again, they've just unified, right? They've done something that hasn't been done in centuries. Uh, they have, um, you know, all of these positive strengths to them. And, and in the process of unification, they took that piece of real estate, Alsace-Lorraine, away from France, creating great tensions between France and Germany. Where is this all going to eventually blow up? Well, I'm hoping you see where this is going. Eventually, this is all going to blow up in World War I. Um, if there was no unified Germany, you don't have World War I, guys. And if you don't have World War I, you don't have World War II. So this is one of the big dominoes to fall. This is why I say this is probably one of the most important topics I talk about that students don't know much about. Uh, you know, this is going to be key. Now, are there other causes to World War I? Absolutely. There are events with Austria, Serbia. We're going to do a whole deep lecture on World War I. Uh, it's coming up shortly. It's a very important lecture, actually. A series of lectures we'll do on World War I. Uh, but at this moment, I hope you see how this all connects. So that's it. That's kind of the story of the unification of Italy and Germany. Know the causes. Know the process. Know the impacts. And some of these impacts we're going to come back to later in future lectures. So I hope all that's very clear. Again, uh, I get a lot of that information you're going to need for your next quiz. Uh, you're going to have another couple lectures before your next quiz as well, of course. Uh, so you just want to stay on top of everything and don't fall behind. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.